the younger you are, the less protein you need to turn on that switch to produce new muscle or to synthesize new muscle. The, um, the more you age or the older you are, the more protein is required to turn on that switch. Hey guys, welcome back to the Danny Bossa Podcast. I'm joined again with uh, Robbie Bennett from Dublin, Ireland. Uh, Robbie is a functional nutrition practitioner, strength coach, personal trainer, uh, close friend and protege of our good friend, Eric Serrano. And he's an expert in digestive issues, metabolic issues, food and sensitivities, optimizing hormones, nutrition, and training. Um, so I had a question for you, Robbie, in regards to protein. I know you're a huge proponent of protein and you've done a lot of discussions about that. Um, ever since I was, I don't know how old, and I started reading up on the stuff, uh, I was always told that the body can only absorb roughly 20 to 30 grams of protein or something along those lines, plus or minus a bit, uh, per meal. And that if you say, you know, I'm just going to make this big protein shake in the morning with, you know, 100 grams of protein, um, you're essentially just going to get to piss away a lot of it. Your body won't make use of it, it won't absorb it. Uh, and I'm starting to read lately that that could potentially be a myth. Uh, is that something you can clarify and sh shed some light on? Okay, so when it comes to absorbing a certain amount of protein each meal, if we eat 100 grams of protein, we absorb 100 grams of protein. Uh, not absorbing a certain amount if you go beyond the threshold is just simply untrue. Now, when we talk about protein consumption, What's the result we're looking to elicit from consuming protein? It's generally to increase the rate of muscle protein synthesis or decrease the amount of muscle protein breakdown. So synthesis, building new tissue, breakdown, obviously breaking down some sort of tissue. It can be adipose like fat tissue or muscle tissue. Now, when it comes to muscle protein synthesis, there is a minimum threshold required to activate that. And there is a really uh, a point of diminishing return when it comes to protein intake. So again, when it comes to absorbing protein, we absorb 100% of what we consume. But not all of that protein might actually go to eliciting muscle protein synthesis. Okay, so what you're saying is, you know, if you're, if you're somebody was to somehow ingest 500 grams of protein a yep. day, it doesn't necessarily mean that all of this is going to be building muscle and they're just going to start getting jacked like they're on steroids. There, there will be a point in time that the body is like, okay, I, I, you know, I can't, I, I can't put this protein completely to use. Of course. So that mainly comes down to the amount and the sequence of amino acids coming in. So individuals don't really have um, a recommended daily allowance of protein per day. We really more so have uh, a daily a recommended daily allowance of essential amino acids. So when it comes to amino acids, we have um, eight to nine essential amino acids in the body. That ninth one is histidine. It can be argued whether that's essential or not. And what these amino acids, essential meaning that we, we can't make it in our body, therefore we need to consume it. One that's quite a popular amino acid is leucine. All right, so if you're not familiar with what leucine does, leucine has been shown to be associated with um, turning on the switch for muscle protein synthesis. Now, we need around three to five um, grams of leucine to do so. And that roughly equates to around 25 to 30 grams of protein per meal. So that's where when it comes down to, okay, we can only absorb so much. Well, that's usually the amount that we, we turned on that switch or turned on the factory to start producing new tissue. Now, if we decide to eat 60, 70, 80, even 100 grams of protein, we've already turned on the factory. Now we've just got excess of amino acids in influ uh, influx and we don't really have much more to do with them other than just convert them to glucose or to, to store them in other parts of the body. We're not actually going to use that as um, building new lean mass. Okay. Now, when it comes to amino acids, uh, we've got obviously our essential amino acids, which I've spoken about, and we also have the branch chains, BCAAs. BCAAs are leucine, isoleucine, and valine. 
And when it comes to those, um, you know, a lot of the research now is coming out that they're actually probably not that beneficial when it comes to building muscle. And one of the reasons why is you need all the essential amino acids to build new tissue. Okay, so, so what you mean is just taking, just supplementing with BCAs. If you're not getting enough of the other stuff, it just doesn't really do yeah. the job that you think it might. Okay. All that's going to do is if you could think about a, a massive car factory and you've got no materials in that car factory, all that leucine does is leucine is the worker that walks in, turns on the lights for the machinery and for all the electronics in the factory. If you have no materials to make new cars, good luck. All the other essential amino acids are the other raw materials and all the other workers that can help produce new tissue. Okay. And when it, when it comes to that, if we have higher amounts of certain amino acids and lower amounts of others, obviously we're going to have issues, we're going to have backlog and we're going to have um, you know, slower parts working. So we'll see some BCAAs where if you ever see the ratio, it says usually two to one to one. If we see BCAAs with a 14 to one to one ratio, that means you've got 14, time, 14 times leucine to the other um, branch chains, which is just moronic because um, what has been shown now, I think, um, by a researcher on the name of Robert Wolf, I believe it is, if you're taking excessive leucine um, relative to other amino acids, it can actually put your body in a state of catabolism because you're breaking down skeletal muscle to find the other essential amino acids uh, to actually build okay. the tissue. Got so um, when we look at certain formulas of amino acids out there, you need to look at the ratios of each. And it's not just about having just all eight. It's about, okay, the distribution and the ratios of each. The so is it safe to say, sorry, is it safe to say that if you're eating sufficient amounts of protein throughout the day, that supplementing with any kind of amino acid is not really necessary, or is it still wise to supplement with some of them at all? It's kind of like the same school of thought to say, you might, even though you've got a fantastic diet, you might still be lacking in uh, essential vitamins and minerals. It's good to take a multivitamin, multimineral. Yeah. Is that kind of the same with amino acids or not quite? I think so. In my opinion, essential amino acids would probably be one of the more foundational supplements because people associate it with being more a performance supplement, but I, I think it can have benefit with performance, but I also think it's quite a good health supplement because we think about muscle mass or skeletal muscle, it's really a reservoir of amino acids. Now, when we have someone that's sick or unwell and we're not ingesting adequate amounts of essential amino acids, the body will say, well, we need them regardless. So we're going to break down tissue in order to have circulating levels of essential amino acids. So when we think about um, sarcopenia, which is essentially um, muscle wasting as we age, that we have, like there's pandemics going on or, or there was recently. Well, what about the pandemic of sarcopenia muscle wasting? So really we want to maximize synthesis of muscle and minimize breakdown. So we look at any metabolic condition or you know pathology it's usually associated with breaking down the tissue so i think for anyone that has any metabolic conditions essential amino acids could be definitely warranted okay so uh, just to clarify if you're eating sufficient protein a day you know let's say you're doing the pound to pound okay. and a half or whatever it yeah. was that golden rule that people use should you still be supplementing then with some essential amino acids or is it the, is, is the supplementations more for people that are potentially not getting enough protein in their diet? I think it's age and goal dependent because the younger you are, the less protein you need to turn on that switch to produce new muscle or to synthesize new muscle. The, um, the more you age or the older you are, the more protein is required to turn on that switch. I didn't know that. Okay, yes. so you're not getting the same bang for the buck no. per gram of protein when you're younger than, okay, got So it. for instance, let's say you, um, in your 20s, you decide to have 150 grams of protein a day and we just split that up with three meals. But as you age, your ability to um, increase, or not increase, let's say turn on muscle protein synthesis with that same amount of protein actually decreases because we don't absorb as much protein as we age just because our digestive and enzymatic function and stomach acid is all impaired. We're just simply not as anabolic. So by potentially, like, when we look at when we're most catabolic, it's usually in the morning because we fasted over a prolonged period of right. time. So right. I think it'd be quite beneficial to make sure in the morning we definitely hit that, I would go above minimum threshold 
to start synthesizing new muscle and even potentially add some supplemental amino acids as a drink with your breakfast to make sure you're turning on that switch, especially as we age for overall okay. health and longevity. And not and is there, those essential amino acids. So, you know, upon waking would be a good time to take, have a high protein meal and of supplement. Of course, that's definitely the best one. Okay. And then is there a good timing for, you know, for someone that says, you know, let's say someone that says, I don't eat enough food throughout the day, but I'm going to have at least one shake a day that's got just, you know, loads of protein in it to try to make up my, 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 my to hit my, my macros or hit my goals throughout the day. Is there a, a time that maybe a higher protein meal should be, should occur throughout the day? Should you just say, I'll take a lot of it in the morning and then I'll, the rest of it kind of around training window? Um, is there, you know, is there a good timing for for protein? Let's say for the general guy who's training, or a good t- timing for uh, amino acid supplementation. Yeah, so I think there's definitely um, more optimal times to consume protein. So um, it's much better to have pulsations of muscle protein synthesis throughout the day, so ups and downs, rather than just have its high. 24 7 so rather than like an iv of essential amino acids okay our body seems to preference those pulsations so um, intermittent fasting is quite popular over in ireland i presume it's similar uh, over yeah. um, your part of the world with intermittent fasting it, it can be very beneficial to people that are obviously overweight and obese and so on just simply because they're consuming less calories and less energy but there you generally don't see people that fast quite a lot with that much muscle mass so what i would say is the first meal of the day is definitely most important because if, especially if someone's like most people fast 8 10 maybe 12 hours throughout the night so that first meal let's let's call it a protein sandwich where the first meal of the day you would definitely want to have higher amounts of protein so let that might be in, I, we talked about that minimum amount is that five three to five grams of leucine which equates to 30 grams of protein just to be safe, I might go 35, 40 grams, maybe even 50. Right. And we sw- switched on that um, that lighter, that switch for synthesizing new tissue. And we've got that spike. Now for lunchtime around 12 or one, we still have a bit of anabolism there. So I don't think it's as important. You can maybe have a lighter snack, maybe 25 grams or 15 grams. And then for dinner again, because we're going to be fasting throughout the night, I would have a higher bump of protein again. But what most people do, especially in Ireland, is they have a very light breakfast, a moderate lunch, and a very heavy dinner. Where okay. I, I would I would like to have a, a higher protein breakfast. Um, now, what if you're doing the intermittent fasting, but you tend to start eating potentially around noon or one o'clock? Like when I do intermittent fasting, yeah. that's what I usually do. I'll eat between maybe. 12 or 12 or so to maybe about 6 six thirty. I okay. stop from there and then I'll, I'll go th- the rest of the morning obviously till till I have to eat again um, with taking just the aminos upon waking impact that in- intermittent fasting um, you know because I'm assuming there are there ca- are there calories in just straight up amino acids so that's a really good question and I would say is it breaking your fast yeah because there there is calories coming in via those amino acids via that protein but just because you're breaking your fast is that are you losing potential benefits from it so some people will fast because they want the body composition effects they want the cognitive benefits and so on mm-hmm. but if you're taking amino acids to um, decrease the rate of muscle protein breakdown now you're getting the benefits almost of a fast you're getting in those essential amino acids and you're um, either at minimum putting the brakes on for breakdown or even synthesizing new tissue. So I think it's a really good idea. I personally do recommend it, but it's not considered a fast anymore because you have simply broken it, but some would, some would consider it a protein sparing modified fast. Okay. Okay. Got it. But I think it's um, massively ben- beneficial. Okay. So th- if you're going to be doing intermittent fasting, and you're only going to be eating for a given number of hours. You could have some massively protein, uh, protein-rich foods, and not be concerned about you know uh, I'm, my body's like we're saying at the beginning my body's only going to absorb a, a certain amount. You will absorb everything, no matter yeah, what. You so you can have, have three meals at uh, you know 50, 60, 70 grams of protein, and it's not a concern. I, I don't think it's a concern. No, and I think with intermittent fasting, I think it's even more important. 
because the meal frequency is down. So, and you're in a catabolic state. So you, when you have that first meal, I think protein is of utmost importance. Actually, the Greek word for protein, I think is proteos, which means uh, of first or of prime importance. So I thought that was pretty cool. And it is of, of prime importance. You need to be having that um, at, at minimum in that first meal. And if you're not like, okay, then we're gonna be having carbs or fats where, okay, it, it'll it maybe have some satiety to the meal, but you're not optimizing body composition. Right, okay. Anything else you care to add on this uh, subject, Robbie, that we didn't touch? I would say you obviously want to be consuming those high quality essential amino acids through whole foods firstly. So we look at uh, meats, um, skeletal meats, skeletal muscle meats like um, red meats or chicken or fish, eggs are all quite good sources. Supplementally, um, I do, my, my preference is always a good essential amino acid blend. Whey proteins are okay, casein proteins are okay. And then there are some vegan blends out there. With vegans, vegetarians, um, they're gonna have a big issue trying to get in that adequate leucine amount. So I think for anyone that is restricting their meat or um, yeah, meat, fish, poultry for any reason, I would suggest essential amino acids um, even more to those individuals because it's even more important. Yeah, that was something else I was reading about lately is that people that are either vegans or vegetarians, even though they are getting some protein in their diet, they're not getting the full array of all of the amino acids that they typically have to supplement. Yeah. That only and the ratios you know, are different. things like red meat or whatever, the only foods out there that have the whole gamut uh, of uh, amino acids. And just by going vegan or vegetarian, you're missing out on some of these things that they typically would need to supplement because they're not going to get it from their diet. Is that accurate? That would definitely be accurate. And the argument is sometimes is, oh, well, in certain foods, we do get enough of those amino acids. But in my opinion, the problem is, okay, yes, those foods might have traces of those amino acids, but to get the amounts you're going to need, the amount of calories you're going to ingest is going to be just um, out of proportion, in my opinion. So if you were to eat, let's say, 100 grams of steak, and okay, let's say for instance, 100 grams, that may be 28 grams of protein and however many calories to consume that amount of protein and that distribution of amino acids um, through a vegan or vegetarian diet. In my opinion, you're going to be consuming a lot more calories unless you're supplementing with some sort of protein blend or amino acids. Gotcha. Okay. There's it up. Thank you very much, Robbie. Okay.